Coming up on Tech News Today, Nest wants to make smoke alarms cool. Can they do it? Samsung wants to buy themselves into becoming a software maker. Can they do that? And Apple wants to crush Pandora overseas. Can any of these companies do any of these things? You'll have to watch the show and find out. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, October 8th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all sizes with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP solutions. Visit TechServe.com slash TNT and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is Tech News Today. It's a show where we look at all this tech news and we go, wow, that's a lot of freaking tech news. You know what might be fun for people is if somebody just kind of told you the most important stuff and put it in context for you. So that's what we do, starting with the top 10 stories of the day, the news fuse. HP unveiled the HP Chromebook 11 with an 11.6 inch screen, 1366 by 768, by the way, weighing only 2.3 pounds and carrying a Samsung dual core Exynos 520 processor, two gigabytes of RAM, gigabytes, they're just gigabytes, and a 16 gigabyte <laughs> flash drive. It also has a very cell phone like micro USB charger. The white plastic case comes with blue, red, yellow, or green accent lines. Chromebook 11 is available now for $280 in the U.S. and £229 in the U.K. Hipster thermostat maker Nest is adding a new product to its lineup this November, the Nest Protect Smoke Detector, priced at $129. The company is also releasing version 4.0 of its app for the web, iOS, and Android. You can receive notifications for low battery alerts on the new smoke detector. Heads up is a feature if smoke or carbon monoxide levels are rising and emergency alarms on your iDevice. It's also Wi-Fi enabled, so in theory, you'll connect it to your smart thermostat and other internet supported devices in your home. The Wall Street Journal reports that an NSA data center in Utah has suffered 10 meltdowns in the past 13 months. Now, these meltdowns were due to chronic electric surges. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment was destroyed due to these issues. The Utah data center is expected to be the NSA's main facility for storing and decrypting all of that data it collects. Oh, I wonder if healthcare.gov is hosted out of there, too. Gold paint on a phone? Ha! HTC One is in 18 karat gold plating and will be available October 19th in Glasgow for five people it's it's a special phone for the mobo awards uh one of which will go to the winner of the best newcomer and slightly more attainable news the wall street journal reports a 5.9 inch htc1 max so it's big with a fingerprint scanner will come out october 16th at an event in hong kong that'll make it come out october 15th here in north america in case you're seeing conflicting reports it's that dateline just confuses things after announcing in August that he'd be stepping down as CEO within the next 12 months, Steve Ballmer's final shareholder letter to Microsoft employees and, and the like is full of optimism about the future. Ballmer notes 2013 is a pivotal year as Microsoft shifts from being just a software company to also being a hardware business. And buying Nokia's device and services business is a signature event in the company's transformation. So, I don't know, it sounds like everything's coming up roses once... Microsoft finds a replacement who can carry out this new vision of Microsoft. The United States executive branch declined a, to veto an important ban on certain Samsung products. The ITC had issued an import ban on some Samsung products due to patent infringement. Now, Samsung asked for a veto of the ban on public policy grounds, which was declined. Now, Samsung can seek a delay of the ban from a U.S. appellate's court. 
AMD announced new Radeon graphics cards officially today. At the low end, the Radeon R7 240, the R7 250, and the R7 260X will be targeted at everyday gamers. Serious gamers are supposed to go for the AMD Radeon R9 270X and the R9 280X with 4K resolution and AMD's iFinity multi-monitor technology. The 280X 3GB card is almost twice as fast as the previous 6970 and supposedly 39% faster than the NVIDIA GT x 760 which has two gigabytes of main memory the r240 starts in at 69 dollars and the prices range up to the r9 280 280x in the 299 dollars cards all will be available october 11th paypal has announced a new feature called the payment code that will allow paypal users to pay for things in physical retail stores by scanning a qr code generated in the app or by using a one-time four-digit code in stores that use pins but don't have scanners. Customers will check into a store using the PayPal app, then receive a pin or a QR code, and then purchases will be debited normally from the PayPal account. The payment code is set to roll out sometime early next year. Android police feel pretty confident that Google Plus Hangouts is going to get SMS and MMS integration. They got some screenshots that show it. Uh, Android police's sources also say Hangouts version 1.3 will allow sharing of videos through the Hangout protocol. Will it replace your messaging app on an Android phone? Reply hazy. Try again. Starting today, Yahoo is launching a new version of Yahoo Mail. You'll get one terabyte of space for free. Yahoo also made previously pay-only features like pop mail and email forwarding available for free as well. There's also a facelift thanks to themes from Flickr Images. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and easy way to get rid of your old gadgets but turn them into cash. Now, it doesn't do it instantly like you just put it down on your table and go gazelle and it turns into cash, but it's just about as good as you can get close to that. What you do is you go to gazelle.com, that's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, find your item, tell gazelle the condition, and be honest, they'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. Then get your risk-free offer for your gadgets and free shipping. You plug that in and you will get 30 days to send them your gadget. When they get it, they'll turn around fast by check, PayPal, or an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. That's what you get paid. They're taking iPhone 5s, they're taking iPhone 4Ss, Samsung Galaxy S2s, Samsung Galaxy S3s. Find out what your phone is worth. Your iPhone, your Samsung phone, your tablet. Take a minute, go to gazelle.com. Do it now because your phone may lose value the longer you wait. Gazelle.com, we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now around the old table to talk about the news of the day is the host of Nozilla Cast, Ms. Allison Sheridan. Welcome to Tech News Today, Allison. It's great to have you on. Hey, glad to be here, Tom. And uh, had I thought that people would rhyme the name of my show with Mozilla, I would have named it something else. It's Nozilla Cast. Well, it's Allison backwards. You could have gone Nadarez, which is your last name backwards, but I think <laughs> I you made the that. right choice, frankly, yeah, honestly. <laughs> Easily uh, is clever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nest spelled backwards is Tsen. That doesn't make any sense either. But what does make sense <laughs> is a new kind of smoke detector, or does it? I heard about it a little bit in the news fuse. It's a smoke and carbon monoxide detector. Uh, they're trying to say, we want to make it better. Your experience shouldn't be to want to pull the battery out of your smoke alarm. That's not good. That's not going to protect you. So they've made a bunch of cool little features in here. Uh, low battery will send you a, a, an alert, a heads up alert to your phone and let you know, hey, it's time to replace the batteries. The, the heads up alerts will also include, hey, we think there's carbon monoxide or smoke building up. We're not going to, we're not, we're not ready to raise an alarm yet. But if you're cooking, you know, you might want to take care of that now. And you can also just wave your hand to shut off the alarm if you're like, no, I know what this is. It's the cookies burning. Uh, there's also a what to do feature in case of an actual emergency. It will allow you like quick access to calling 911 on your phone, things like that. And the other thing is they have a voice that talks to you during the alert because a Victoria University study said that a female voice registers better with children than a noise in waking them up. And so, so they have a video up that kind of explains all this, but uh, here, here's a little example of that. Emergency, there's smoke. 
barely, you can almost barely hear it there, but it's a female voice with the beeping saying emergency, there's smoke. It also tells you what room it's in. It remembers what room it's in. Uh, six AA batteries last five years, or you can get a wired version that goes into your power. Then you put three batteries in as a backup supply in case the power goes out. White or black versions, $129 available in November in the United States or 109 pounds available October 30th in the UK. That price alone is, is a point of contention for a lot of people who may be used to spending a lot less on a smoke detector. Allison, does it make it worth it to you, do you think? Absolutely. Uh, Steve and I immediately bought two of these the minute we saw it. And uh, I think the thing about a smoke detector is it's a device you hardly ever have to deal with. And yet whenever you think about it, you only think with hatred, right? You're, you're oh, just yeah. a... <laughs> it's always, oh, I hate that thing. You know, it's not, gee, that'll probably save my life someday. So what they've done is they've, this video is great. I mean, I teared up a little bit in the middle of it. You know, just the idea of getting like some fog rolls in and it, the alarm goes off. You just wave your hand, go, never mind, never mind. That's not a problem. It goes, oh, okay, I'll be good. I, I think it's I think it's a fabulous device. And if you combine the uh, the cost of the carbon monoxide sensor, you know, that starts to be, get kind of appealing. We've got separate sensors for those and I hate all of them. So I think it's, uh, I don't think the price will really kill you. And I was glad to see they had a wired version because we have wired smoke detectors. So at least we don't have to deal with the dead battery issue. But uh, I think it looks pretty cool. I'm excited about it. I'm a big yeah, fan. It's, of I, I don't think it's uh, that expensive, really. I, I know that uh, some of the internet was kind of combusting this morning. $130 uh, smoke detector, my God. Busting. But it is Smoke and carbon monoxide detector. I have a carbon monoxide detector for the first time, as far as I know, in this apartment now. And it's like, it plugs into a little outlet. It's huge. So it like ruins the whole outlet. I can't use it for anything else. And it's totally an eyesore and it's kind of in the way. But I'm like, oh, well, I certainly don't want to die of carbon monoxide poisoning so that I'm not going to do anything about it. But but yeah, I think it's a mixture of, it does look cool. It's, it's cool to think that this is just the next uh, in the kind of daisy chain of home appliances that everybody has to have that can, in theory, talk to each other one day uh, pretty seamlessly, just, you know, using your smartphone and you don't even necessarily have to be in the house. And, um, and yeah, I mean, smoke detectors are supposed to save your life, not be some annoying thing that goes off when, yeah, you burn something in the kitchen. And, and I think most of us don't even take them that seriously for that reason. I like what Ness is doing with these things that you have. You have to have these in your house. You have your thermostat. And those are usually like these hideous looking things. And Ness has a pretty version of that. Now you've got this smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector, which also looks good, but is very functional. Uh, they're slowly building out the smart home. If you're going to have a bunch of these devices in your in your house, or that maybe that's why it's called Nest, right? That's where you nest. So you have all of these devices. Uh, and having a bunch of these, if they're networked together, would be really helpful. I know at some points I've been in houses where. The smoke detector will go off, but you don't know which one it is because that noise is piercing and you have no <laughs> idea. You get closer to one, you're not sure which one it is. Or the little battery chirp that only goes off once yes. every two minutes and you're like... <laughs> and you're like, where is it? So if that functionality alone will save you you know, this this uh, madness, it might be worth 129 bucks. But it is pretty pricey. Nest obviously can, can market it pretty simply as it's about your life here and convenience. So if you're going to have a device like this, why not have one of the best ones you could have on the market? Yeah, it's eighty dollars for I'm a normal carbon monoxide smoke detector from like Omnilert or somebody. So you're 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 spending an extra fifty bucks here. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Well, how much does a smoke detector by itself cost? I've never like had 30. to buy one. Yeah, smoke detector on its own is about thirty bucks, thirty okay. or forty. Yeah. So they, these these are more expensive, but then it has Wi-Fi built into it. It can, can talk to your thermostat if you have a Nest thermostat. One of the most common sources of carbon monoxide in a house is the furnace malfunctioning. So one of the cool things that can do if you have a Nest thermostat is tell the thermostat to turn off the furnace if there's carbon monoxide mm -hmm. detected. So, you know, there's nifty things and it can tell other smoke detectors in the house where the, the fire is. So if you're in your bedroom and there's smoke detected in the living room, it could say smoke detected in living room. So you know to avoid the living room on your way out, stuff like that. I mean, probably maybe the flames would show you too, but. Uh, you know, if, if it didn't say nest on it, I'm not sure I would have jumped on it if it had been, you know, Bob's house of smoke detectors came out with this. But it's nest. <laughs> oh, it's cool. Okay, I'm going to buy two of them. Yeah, Bob's right now, pretty but. good at what he does. Okay. Yeah, he but. is. No the market. He's no Tony Fidel, though. And remember, this is the guy who worked on the iPod, who brought the iPod to Apple, former Apple employee. I think Nest is carving out a, uh, a, a niche for itself that's going to be pretty huge 
10 years down the road. I think we may be looking at Nest as one of the giants in the field because they are actually building an internet of things while everyone else is talking about it. And I think that's that's something to, to point out and, and pay attention to. Samsung's playing catch up when it comes to software. They would they would like to have more software because they want to have control. Is that is that what's going on here, Ayaz? Yeah, the Wall Street Journal has an article about Samsung looking to pick up software companies. They got its, uh, the journal got its hands on internal mergers and acquisitions presentation prepared back in February. Now Samsung's looking at a bunch of different companies. Uh, there's Unity Technologies. You probably know them because they power a bunch of games. It's a game development ecosystem. It powers things like Call of Duty Strike uh, game. Green Throttle is another company they're looking at. Uh, that makes game controllers for Android devices, and it connects the two things to televisions. It also, back in February, was looking at Atari. Now, Atari ended up selling its parts to other companies, but it, Samsung wanted to buy Atari to offer classic games like Pong and Asteroids exclusively on their phones. Uh, Glimpse is another company they're looking at, apparently are still in talks with. Uh, the idea of possibly Samsung putting in an equity investment the journal says that discussions are still ongoing. Everything.me, which is a, a dynamic Android launcher, which so if you're looking up something like Skyfall, all of your apps for movies come up. The background changes to something like James Bond. It's actually a pretty cool uh, free application available for Android now. And Rounds, a video chat app that lets you play games together and share photos, that kind of FaceTime kind of competitor. Allison, which company would you want to see snapped up by Samsung? <laughs> well, you know, in looking at the things that they, they are uh, considering buying or rumored to be considering buying, it made me think about if, let's say they executed on all of these, is a bunch of different disparate software companies all kind of kind of being crammed together into one uh, device really going to get them where they want to go? I do like to see a company that's on top, you know, pushing to go faster. This isn't a, a desperation move or anything like that. Um, for, according to the Wall Street Journal article, part of what they're trying to do is differentiate themselves, of course. But they also even talked about the operating system that they bought. I think I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but that they're trying to uh, get themselves away from Android so they can be even more differentiated. So I'm not sure that a single application is the answer as much as they, they better be working on how would we integrate all these things to make a good user experience. Because just if just because Maps is really cool, that doesn't make you go buy this phone, right? No, I, I think like something like Glimpse would be really interesting, right? If the Samsung Galaxy S4 had a built-in way of saying, oh, you can automatically tell your friends where you are. It's kind of like Find My Friends on the phone, on the iPhone. But I have to say... I don't know if I like the idea of Samsung having more control of the software on its phone. I mean, I know they're trying to get off of Android with Tizen. Maybe that's good to have more operating systems competing in the marketplace, but it's not good to have one manufacturer in control of everything. There are big disadvantages to that with Apple and iOS. Mm -hmm. We see that sort of lack of cross-platform capability. If you're going to have a phone in the Android universe, I think it should be taking advantage of the openness of the Android universe. Maybe we get three the way we've all been talking about. Are there going to be three? But it's going to be uh, Tizen and, and uh, Samsung with uh, iOS and the, and the iPhone. And then the third is all the other Android stuff. That'd be weird. I think the everything.me is the most interesting potential acquisition because it does have this. I was looking at the app this morning and the way it works is that when you're searching for something, all the apps you want kind of come to the top when you're doing a search. Now, I have tons of applications installed on my Android devices, and cycling through them or having customized home pages or having custom folders is work, but it's almost like having an intelligence in the launcher. Samsung's Touch with UI is either loved or hated, depending on who you are. I really despise it. I think it's clunky. It really just detracts from the, clean, uh, the cleanliness of Android. If they could say that your phone reacts to you, that might be a little bit more interesting, especially if it cleans up that mess that's TouchWiz. Clean up your mess, Samsung. That's Ayaz's message to you. I, 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 I think Samsung would love your idea, Allison, of Tizen becoming the third operating <laughs> system. It's a, a whole other matter to make it happen. But who knows? Maybe if they bought enough software, they would be able to do it. I'm a little skeptical on that myself. Yeah, I think when I look at all of these potential acquisition companies, uh, none of them really stand out to me as, well, that is just going to put Samsung over the top. Everyone's going to flock to Samsung if they haven't already because there's a glimpse built in. I, I mean, a lot of... A lot of these startups uh, that exist out there, you know, aren't exactly novel concepts. I mean, something like Everything.me, which I'm familiar with, is, is super cool. Um, but it's not as if if Samsung 
is able to pull that into the Samsung experience. You can't replicate something that's convenient another way. That said, collectively, I think uh, Samsung would be able to, you know, little by little, separate itself from the pack to the point where, yeah, I mean, even if it was still um, re uh, reliant on Android as its dominant operating system, it, it'll just more and more be a completely different experience than anything you can get anywhere else. Meanwhile, Apple targeting Pandora. How is that? How's that going to work out? Sarah, what's well, the story? we already know that they're gunning for Pandora with iTunes Radio, which, of course, is a new feature in the latest version of iTunes, which rolled out uh, at the same time that iOS 7 uh, rolled out. We're getting some reports from uh, people with knowledge of the situation talking to Bloomberg. It says iTunes may get I, uh, Apple rather may get iTunes Radio into the UK and Canada by early next year. So that's, you know, just a few months away at this point. The company's also planning to launch early next year in Australia and New Zealand, plus some unnamed Nordic countries. What's interesting about that is iTunes Radio's obvious most closest competitor is Pandora. Pandora has been a, a staple in the U.S. for some time. It is also in Australia and New Zealand. It is not in the U.K. or Canada, though. So you might say, all right, well, what's the difference? Why wouldn't Pandora be in the U.K., say, when iTunes Radio seems to be able to move pretty quickly? Uh, apparently, Apple made agreements for international rights with Vivendi's Universal Music Group and other record companies Pandora, of course, by contrast, their business is based on rights granted by government entities. So uh, that limited, limited limits service to the U.S. and Australia and New Zealand. So, okay, well, that would be interesting. If Apple doesn't have any Pandora competition in a new market, a large market like, say, the U.K., how does that change the landscape? Here, uh, we know that around 11 million people at least sampled iTunes Radio, tried it out, listened to a station or two uh, in the five days after it became available. So definitely a lot of interest. But I know for me, I've had a Pandora account for a really long time. iTunes Radio is a, a different experience, but roughly based on the same model. So it kind of turns into, well, do I jump ship? Because now I just have another alternative. Very different situation. Let's say if I live in Canada and I'm like, well, I've heard about Pandora for a long time now and I've never had access iTunes Radio is basically the next best thing that's already built into an experience I may already be using. I mean, what do we think of all this? What, 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 uh, how does the landscape change when you don't have an incumbent radio uh, service like Pandora in a big new market? Alson, you want to you want to what you want to weigh in? <laughs> well, I'm just amazed at any company that can uh, actually go out in all these different com uh, countries. I worked in a giant. Uh, company, an 80,000 person company that was mostly U.S. based, and we couldn't even make decisions state to state. You know, this state hated this state, and we hated those guys, and these guys hated these guys. I, I'm just baffled that any company like Apple can sell in all these different countries. So when they go off and say, well, oh, yeah, we'll just do Canada. Okay, maybe Canada's not that hard of an example, but I'm just shocked and amazed that they can ever do any of this. Yeah, without Pandora, Apple's got a real chance to become a leader in those markets. Uh, I, I was using iTunes Radio the other day, and if I get sick of ads, even though I'm not supposed to have them because I have iTunes Match, I can always jump back to my playlists or create new radio stations really quickly within that same application. It's just you know it's toggling a switch as opposed to going into Pandora with a different UI, uh, whether you want to pay for that or not to, to lose those ads as well. If, if, if Apple gets into these markets without Pandora being there as a, as a barrier, Apple has a real chance to become, a, a, I guess, a surprising leader in, in streaming radio because and there's companies like Spotify and Pandora. Everyone else is out there. But Apple's the big dog when it comes to music. I think it shows, too, how restrictive these kinds of laws are to innovation. A an example of how Pandora could launch in the United States, even though it has some pretty restrictive licensing rules, because they didn't have to go and negotiate for them. It was a mechanical rule that they could take advantage of. In other countries, they can't. They just can't launch. They don't have the weight to negotiate. It takes a behemoth like Apple to be able to have enough weight to bring a service like this. And I, and I think that shows a weakness in how these laws reduce innovation at 
at, at a questionable protection of artist revenues. I mean, are, are the artists actually going to get better revenues if nobody's innovating in the space and, and there's fewer people competing to sell music? I don't think so. So it, it's kind of what I took out of this story. Take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, TechServe. It's T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E. -E -E. They're in New York, but you can use them. They're the premier authorized Apple reseller and technology provider, and they've been serving creative professionals at all levels for a long time, from individual customers like you right up to Fortune 100 companies like you, because maybe you're part of a Fortune 100 company too. They carry a full range of Apple products from iPhones and iPads to iMacs, MacBooks, iPods, accessories, I also have a range of partnerships with top vendors uh, assisting businesses of all sizes to deploy Apple, Avid, and Adobe solutions throughout the United States. Whether you're already committed to iPads or you're just getting started from sales, support process to practice, TechServe can help. Uh, we always talk about the Delta terminals. I, I, whenever I'm not in a Delta terminal, I'm jealous because in LaGuardia Airport, New York, in Toronto, and in Minneapolis, these Delta terminals are gorgeous. They have an iPad at every seat. You can check your mail, you can check your flight status, you can even order food from them. And TechServe is the one that helped OTG Management, the hospitality company behind Delta's terminals, roll these things out. If they can do that for the Delta terminals, they can do it for you. It's double-digit increase in food and beverage revenue and the highest customer satisfaction scores at all participating airports. TechServe wants to help you too. They provide ongoing support. So if your enterprise has a problem, helps just a phone call away. They don't abandon you after rolling out the devices. If your business is considering integrating iOS technology at your workplace, contact TechServe today. Receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Visit TechServe.com. That's T-E-K-S-E-R-V-E dot -E -E com slash T-N-T. And TechServe will help you assess your current or future iPad needs and give you advice to make it a success. That's TechServe.com slash T-N-T. Contact them now. We thank TechServe for their support of Tech News Today. Into the future we go. A uh, New York Times article today by Nick Wingfield reports on all the speculation about Bill Gates' future, considering that Steve Ballmer is leaving. Steve Ballmer sent his last letter to shareholders today. It was what you would expect him to say. Oh, I'm going to miss it here, but everything is great, and we're setting Microsoft on the road to success. Well, what else would you expect him to say? Gates has been seen on the Microsoft campus a lot lately. He always has product meetings. He wants people to come and talk to him about the products because he's still the chairman of the board of Microsoft. He's the largest shareholder with 4.52% of the shares. But he usually does it at his office in, in uh, Kirkland. Now he's on the campus a lot. That got people talking. Is he going to come back? Sources tell Wingfield at the New York Times, Gates has no intention of reducing his philanthropic work and returning full-time to Microsoft. Uh, and in fact, last week, there were reports that three shareholders, major shareholders, want Gates out. So he's got a little fight on that end. The list of candidates uh, is, is narrowing down. And the way Wingfield sees it, it's still Alan Mulally, CEO of Ford, although he sort of indicated he's not interesting, interested. He is interesting, but he's not interested. Paul Meritz, uh, a former Microsoft employee, is now leading Pivotal. Tony Bates from Skype, who is internal. Uh, he came from Skype, and now he's uh, an executive within Microsoft. And Stephen Elop, who will soon be an executive within Microsoft again. He's the former CEO of Nokia. Okay, Allison, if you if you were a betting woman, do you think Gates comes back, Gates leaves, or Gates stays exactly where he is and we get a different CEO, and who would it be? Well, I I have to bet on the on the globe because for the for the sake of the world, I really hope uh, Bill Gates isn't even considering this. I mean, you know, run a software company, save the world from disease. You know, it's it's kind of a tough toss up. I can't imagine that he would go back and do that. Um, the the person I have the most respect for is watching Alan Mulally. I noticed uh, last week you guys kind of referred to him as a car guy, but remember he's got degrees in astronautics and aeronautics. He's an aerospace engineer, uh, worked at uh, Boeing forever, and uh, so he was able to go from his engineering background there to transforming uh, Ford when all the other auto companies were plummeting and taking uh, you know bailouts from the government and from our taxpayer dollars. Ford never did. So you see what he did to that company. Uh, he could do anything in my book. I think uh, I think he's really amazing. But if I had to bet, they're going to pick Stephen Elop. <laughs> That's probably what's going to happen, right? I, okay, I I kind of feel that way too. But it doesn't seem to be the conventional wisdom. I ask, what? Where would you place your bets? I would expect Gates to do the same thing he's been doing. He'll say as chairman because he seems to think larger scale at this point. He seems to be more concerned about the world at, at large, not necessarily worried about having a. Microsoft computer on every desk. That's not a big thing anymore uh, for them. I, I don't think that uh, Elop's going to be put in that position just because of how 
uh, he managed Nokia. I'm trying to come up with the right words, the nice words <laughs> of how he, he uh, how he took ma- how he took Nokia and he. Uh, anyway, Nokia was a mess. Anyway, it's really hard to blame Elop for that, but I don't think he's going to be there. Uh, Bates, I think, is probably more likely from Skype. But Mulally, obviously, like I mentioned, we've talked about this before on, on on Windows Weekly when I was on that. The idea that he was so instrumental in advising Steve Ballmer as to the management structure of Microsoft as it is now, it'd be easy for Mulally to come in, and they've had obviously a working relationship as Microsoft Sync is in Ford vehicles, so he does have experience with. Microsoft directly. So if he's going to be the, the candidate that ends up being in charge, I think he's much more likely than Elop. I think Elop is just enjoying a ton of money. I think it's a $25 million payout. He's probably going to go on vacation for a very long vacation soon. Is Alan Mullally's age at 68 going to be a huge factor, though? That is something people have been concerned about, is how long would he be able to last as CEO? Although, I mean, it's not like 68 is that old anymore. Steve Ballmer only lasted as CEO for what 10 years so i mean he could i could still see alan mulally kicking around and in, in 10 years as ceo i just i don't know if he's going to do it if he's going to take it you're right we call him a car guy but we also called him an engineer he's an engineer who knows about cars this is an entirely different business a Sarah, hardware what do you, what do you business think? as well right i mean this is the, the you know the whole thing about microsoft not pivoting but certainly expanding from just being a software company into something uh, that's 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 definitely a mix of hardware and software. Not that Microsoft is going to make cars, but it does uh, it, it it puts less pressure on Alan. Is like, well, where's your software legacy, sir? Do you know what you're doing? And yeah, I feel like at this point, I mean, unless he has health problems, 68 is not really that much of a factor. I mean, this you know, he could be CEO for a really long time if all goes well. I don't think Bill Gates is even in the running. Allison, I agree with you. Uh, I, I, I sort of hope he's not, just because he's doing really, really good uh, foundation work across the world. And you can't run a company and also put as much time and energy into, a, you know, some sort of a, uh, you know, philanthropic foundation. Although I'm sure he has other people who could run the business. It seems like his efforts are in the right place for the good of humanity, at least so right what now. What do we know about Bates and Moritz and their experience, say, in enterprise uh, database software, things like uh, uh, SharePoint and that sort of thing, along with uh, the commercial software side they have? And do they have any hardware experience? I mean, what what do the, do we know about them that would make them qualified for this? Yeah, Bates is a software guy, right? I mean, he's he's a Skype guy, so he's he's going to have enterprise level experience, but he's not going to have that hardware experience. And and Paul Moritz is a services guy. Uh, we, getting a hardware guy is going to be hard internally because you haven't been making a lot of hardware at Microsoft. So, that's so a, if you that's took a, the four of them and mixed them up in a pot together, maybe you had a good CEO for the company. I mean, how can anybody should, know all of this stuff? Really, should see if that Tim Cook guy is available. Maybe he. <laughs> Let's talk about Yahoo getting all redesigned. Uh, some people say it looks like Gmail. Some people say it looks like Flickr, Sarah. Or IaaS, sorry. Well, we, Sarah, I know, we, I mean, we, we look alike you, a lot. You two look so think, much alike. Know, Yahoo's, you all the time. Yahoo's our shared beat, Sarah and I, because we both <laughs> like purple so much, and, and Marissa Meyer is so interesting. Anyway, I'll, I'll take this since I... I have the notes here. Yahoo revamped Yahoo <laughs> Mail today. Uh, update's supposed to go live across the web, Android, iOS, and Windows 8 devices. I haven't seen the update on my on, on the web right now, but I'm sure it's available for somebody. Uh, there's a big new redesign that incorporates Flickr photos. It's not just any random Flickr photo, by the way. Yahoo's working with photographers of 20, with 24 different Flickr images, and they built themes around that. Uh, the theme you pick on your desktop will be the same as the one you'll see on your mobile device. So there's a consistent feel as you move from device to device. Like I mentioned before, pop access, disposable email addresses, and mail forwarding are finally free. The only paid feature is an ad-free Yahoo Mail that'll cost you about 50 bucks a year. Uh, users who already had Mail Plus are grandfathered in and will be able to continue paying around 20 bucks a year for the ad-free version of Yahoo Mail. One terabyte of storage is the same amount you get from Flickr. Uh, which is insane. Uh, functionally, there's some threaded conversations which, which can be expanded inside the inbox. It lets you quickly navigate to, to recent messages. You can click a magnifying glass next to a sender's name that's going to give you every message you've received from that person. And Yahoo's got this promo video, which for the most part shows you very nice young people who are very active occasionally checking their email. So uh, look at them on their cityscape and looking at their mail, which looks a lot like Gmail at that point. Allison, there's some interesting upgrades here, but is it going to get people to move from Google or any other uh, email provider to move to Yahoo? 
Well, I think what it's doing at the very least is is keeping their name in the news, right? You no longer hear, oh, Yahoo. You know, it's it's like, oh, well, look what Yahoo did today. Yahoo did this. Yahoo did that. Um, I, I've been playing with it a little bit this morning, and uh, and it's kind of pretty. Uh, but there, there's one pet peeve I have with uh, new iOS apps. If they don't take advantage of the, um, what is the tool called in iOS 7 that lets you get uh, better text sizes? I forget, dynamic text, I think it's called. Um, they're not doing that. Um, I, I wear glasses and contacts, believe it or not, and I it's really, really tiny, tiny text. It's not obeying any of the uh, rules built into iOS 7, so um, I don't like that very much. Um, it's kind of pretty. It'll auto-launch uh, Flickr. It's got some sections in there for other apps, Flickr, Yahoo uh, Screen, Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Weather, Yahoo Yahoo. Uh, it's got all of those, so that's kind of fun that you can jump in and out of your Yahoo things. But they compared it in the article to Yahoo Weather and how pretty Yahoo Weather is. Well, Yahoo Weather is beautiful. This, eh, not as much. So whether it'll get people to switch, I think maybe it will get people to think about it, to say, oh, well, you know, there's Yahoo and Google where before we were kind of just saying Google for the last, I don't know, five years or so, it seems. Yeah, I feel like some of this stuff is meant more for retention than uh, switching. Uh, maybe maybe for acquiring, if somebody, I, there are people who are new to webmail at every point, right? They're like, for the first time, go into the internet uh, at all ages. And maybe Yahoo's like, hey, let's, you know, maybe they're used to seeing Yahoo because that's what their friends use as a, as a homepage or something. Who knows? It happens. It may not feel, <laughs> feel common to people in our audience, but it happens. And this is a way to have people go, ooh, this looks nice, rather than say, oh, that kind of looks old-fashioned. That Gmail thing looked a little, little niftier. So, yeah, it's not a game changer, but it's also something they have to do to stay current is make it look good. On the other hand, as a Yahoo Mail user myself, I don't want pictures in the background. I want something that's easy to read my email on. That's important to me. But you yeah, get in parallax pictures. inside your app. Yeah. Go ahead, Allison. Lovely. I just said you get parallax inside your app so you can get sick watching that too now. Uh, I had somebody over the weekend discover parallax for the first time and was like, whoa, look at this. And I was like, what? I, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you've been. Welcome but, to iOS But But uh, I think... No amount of pretty photos or features or anything can convince me to switch to Yahoo Mail. I've had a Yahoo email address, you know, that I needed to sign into Flickr type of thing, but I really don't use it. It's not something that is 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 part of my life at all. And I don't want to say, well, I have to stay on Gmail forever because I've just been with the service since 2004. But that's kind of what's going on. I mean, there's such a archive history. There's, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, for the most part, ever break on me. I have to search for things. It's such a part of my life. I don't, as much as I'm like, yeah, Yahoo is doing some really interesting things with design. Mail is not the place I need it in order to jump ship and start a whole new email life somewhere else. I think one of the smarter things Yahoo is doing is removing all of these barriers. When it came to Yahoo Mail, it's like, what do you mean you have to pay for pop? That's like free everywhere else. Why is this a feature that's that's limited here? And by giving you one terabyte of space, it, it's a little bit more attractive because I know I'm staring at my Gmail. Like I think I'm at 56% of whatever uh, gigabytes I have with Google. So to, these these are small features that might make it more attractive. I doubt it's going to make people switch unless they had some kind of like amazing importer that lets you uh, keep your labels and have that same kind of rules set kind of that way. But the consistency, I think, is also very interesting with the iOS apps and the web version. If they feel the same, uh, there's something, it's easy to go from that, from device to device. I know with Gmail, it's very different from the desktop to the Android device to the iOS device, depending on the screen. It's a very different UI. So if it's, if it's consistent, that might grab people or at least keep people, maybe not switching people, but it'll keep. What about, now it's also uh, consistent between iOS 7 and uh, Android and uh, Windows mm -hmm. also too, right? They're all in there today? That's, That's the fundamentals, right? You got to mm -hmm. hit on all those cylinders if you really want to, to maintain. Again, maybe not about switching, but about being looking current when people do finally get around to paying attention to you for whatever reason that may be. Let's talk about smartwatches for children. And this time I will toss the story to the appropriate host, Sarah Lane. <laughs> All right, so this uh, company is called Philip, uh, F-I-L-I-P Technologies, and the company's bringing its first product to market just in time for the holiday season, which is a GPS-enabled mobile watch for kids. Now, you might say, okay, this whole wearable technology thing is just out of control. 
but it's really more for parents than for kids. This is something that apparently has been about three years in product development. And in fact, uh, Philip Technologies has partnered with AT&T uh, to be the exclusive uh, network provider, distributor, and billing service for the device, at least at launch. We don't know exact pricing yet, but the company says it won't be over $200. So what it is, is a watch that's worn by a child. They're targeting kids 11 years old or younger. Just has two little buttons on it, so fairly easy to, to be... Uh, to, to, to be used by the kid, but you hook it up to an app on the uh, parent smartphone. So it can do a few things. You can make and receive calls to the parent, you know, press one button, a uh, kid needs to get a hold of mom or dad, uh, call goes through, pretty easy. Also uses a combination of GPS, cell tower locations, and Wi-Fi triangulation to act as a locator. There's also an emergency button, that sort of thing. So there are a few kind of interesting things that you could do. You can see your child's location that can put parents at ease. You can set up a safe zone, which is sort of like if your uh, kid uh, is, you know, entering their schoolyard or something, or maybe they step outside of the schoolyard and it's something that you want to know about either way, you can set it up to get a push no notification to know where your child is, uh, kind of get a heads up. Again, you can make quick calls if you're sort of like, hey, are you okay? That sort of thing. So, you know, my first reaction is, oh, this is like the digital version of kids on leashes. But it really isn't that because it's not so much designed to make sure your child is nearby you at all times. It's really sort of a safety thing. I don't know, you know not having children, I obviously am not the target mar market for this, but I as I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you've got some thoughts on whether or not this seems invasive, or if this is a great idea, especially for little kids. Uh, the design definitely screams little children because it's like it's very playful. It's, it's it's loud colors, although it kind of looks like an iOS seven app or something, just with loud colors as well. But yeah, I, I could see setting up safe zones for your kid. I have a three year old, so when he's running around, and I don't know where the heck he went. I don't necessarily want to give him his own phone, even though I did. I didn't give him an actual live phone. He has a an Android phone he gets to play with. But anyway, the idea of having this this device on somebody, it's this is kind of like that. I used to joke about this, the idea of chipping your kid, just like you would a pet. But this thing that is always connected, it gives you uh, information as to where they are. I think it gives peace of mind. I know, that, I know there's going to be lots of parents who are probably going to be very interested in getting something like this, especially if it means they don't have to get a child a dedicated cell phone because that's not something little kids are really good at maintaining and this looks like it should be able to take a beating especially if a kid's under 11 years old yeah what is the durability of this i mean you know they if it has a glass screen it's probably prone to shatter <laughs> and kids they, they aren't show, that delicate they say it's going to be uh, uh dirt resistant and mud resistant and water resistant okay. they didn't say smacking resistant though well yeah. what about kid taking it off resistant because we all know <laughs> you know it's it's you never want your kid to walk home with one shoe missing but that happens kids take things off you know, oh, yeah. they lose them. Is it is it is it is it fused to your child's so wrist? So we got to go back to Probably my chipping not. the child concept. Let's go back to that. <laughs> this is not. This doesn't go far enough. You got to chip your kid. This is, this is dead on arrival, you guys. At two hundred dollars, and there's going to be a data plan that goes with it. Right. So and if you live privacy in privacy concerns, because mm -hmm. who's storing this GPS data, and what are the safeguards to make sure that no one else knows where my child is besides me, the parent, and that's. That's a big issue, especially these days. Everybody in the chat room is asking that question. And the logo's really bad. It's capital F, <laughs> lowercase i, L-I-P. How many of you read it as flip? Yeah. In, in the logo, they're not too bad, but when I saw it in uh, typed in the show notes, I never even saw the I. <laughs> I thought it was flip. Maybe it should be flip. <laughs> well, if no, Nest designed this, we would there. love it, is what I'm saying. But Nest didn't exactly. think we're being biased. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I know that there are... There are a lot of dangers out there, and 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 I like. I think the idea of this solution is a good one. I think that it it there are probably a lot of parents saying, "Wow, I mean, if it worked perfectly, this would really ease my mind about a lot of stuff." If you know, my kids sort of have like a panic button that's just part of their day, and they know how to use it, and they know where they're not supposed to be and not be. But I can still have a little bit of uh, control when I when I'm nowhere near my child. I get that. I think that I think. This is, this is probably, we're going to see more products that try to solve this problem. But yeah, I'm not sure that the smartwatch for kids is the right one. It just seems like there are so many ways that it can break or, or not actually be attached to a kid and cause a lot of confusion.
Oh, you lost we, your child in Europe, Mr. Akhtar? I'm sorry. Your uh, plan doesn't cover roaming. roaming. <laughs> Especially for roaming children. We got to do better to get to Europe, though. That's the question. Yeah. Now, the kids that are in the neighborhoods where they really, really need that panic button, they're going to be able to afford this, right? That's right. a lot of money. That is a lot of money with the service plan on top of it, as you pointed out. Let's fire up the randomizer. At a straw poll with our live audience today, four choices. And the winner with 30% close vote today uh, was a sixth grader who won a science contest for an experiment to... Brew beer in space. Michael Bojanovsky, 11 years old, won the national competition uh, for STEM school and academy in Colorado. They actually had to do some fundraising because it's going to cost around $21,000, $21,500 to, uh, to cover the cost of the launch to participate in the program. But his test tube to brew some beer will fly on the International Space Station. He will also be brewing beer in a test tube on the ground uh, to see what differences happen. And the point is not to get astronauts drunk. It's to be able to purify water in space. In fact, that's how he was inspired to make this his entry into the contest was he said he learned that in olden days, people drank beer because it was a purer form of drink than just getting water. Uh, and he's like, well, that might be might be useful up there in space. I mean, this clearly one due to the, the, the title. Beer in space and sixth grader. I mean, there's there's lots of things here. Like there's a child who's willing to make us beer. This child is awesome. And he wants to do it in space. It's even more awesome. Uh, How could they not have picked it, huh? It's just fantastic. Uh, uh, if, if maybe we need to keep a bracelet on him to make sure we can track him so he can make us more beer in space. Uh, I, if I'm one of the, the guys judging this contest, I'm just like... How do we make, how do we justify this? Because that's got to win, right? <laughs> that's got to win, right? Uh, medicinal, medicinal. We can say medicinal, right? We can, uh, yeah, we yeah. claim it's medicinal. Uh, limited human interaction for brewing beer. Perfect, perfect for space, right? Right? Am I right? Yeah, <laughs> it's winning. 3,900 students, uh, proposals out of 744 uh, proposals. Yeah, I think some other kid students. wanted to like cure malaria on earth. Pfft, forget that. <laughs> beer yeah, in space. Beer in space. Let's go. I'm ready to go now. Let's also uh, check the calendar. <laughs> MTech is happening starting tomorrow, running through the 11th. That is at MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I I'll hear they're getting it. quite a bit of rain. Oh, yeah? Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a stormy, stormy, stormy week. Stormy, stormy time. Yeah. I raised a space-brewed beer in their honor. Hope they do well. Let's move on to incoming. Incoming message. It's a message from Devon from Trinidad and Tobago. He says, longtime viewer, mostly listener, first time commenter. Regarding yesterday's discussion about flexible screens trapped in a rigid body, I can see at least one reason why this is a good thing. Since the screen is essentially made of plastic instead of glass, won't that mean it can be more impact resistant? The screen is normally the first part of a phone to break if it is dropped. If screens are made of flexible material like plastic, I'm guessing they, they would become a bit more durable if dropped since the impact would be absorbed by the plastic in some way. Another reason why a rigid body is a good thing, batteries and most other components in a phone are not flexible yet, so the rest of the phone can benefit from this protection as well. On the other hand, a wraparound type display that covers the entire front and back of a phone might be in the works for a couple of manufacturers out there. I suppose we'll have to just wait and see. Just my one-fiftieth of a dollar, two cents. Thanks for the show. <laughs> one-fiftieth of a dollar. I Yeah, that, that's a fair point, uh, Devin. And uh, I, as you you looked it up, that's actually part of the, uh, the LG press release. Yeah, and the press right? release, it, it's kind of buried in there. The headline, they'll just say it's bendable and unbreakable. In theory, at least LG claims in its press release for this smartphone display, this is supposed to be an unbreakable display, which means it's very, very hard to break. Now, I thought yeah. I heard yesterday that the display was actually, uh, they said bendable but stiff, that it was going to be uh, in a solid position, that it was just that they could bend it as they build it. Did I yeah, misunderstand the display, that? The, the display is bendable, but they won't be making a bendable case for your phone. So once okay. the display is put in the rigid case, you can't bend your phone. That, that's what's going on. Okay, but so if it is bent into a position that's, you know, some sort of like an arc, an arc is actually a lot stronger than a flat piece, so that's an advantage for that too. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good point. Well, thank you for your email, Devin, in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. Good to hear from Trinidad and Tobago. There, uh, 
there have been fans from Trinidad and Tobago uh, following shows for a long time. Uh, both Tobago, Buzz Out Loud just today. so you know. Tobago. Tobago. And now they're all just, going to just write because me. Because I know the emails will and come. Say Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Tobago. All right. Thank you, Allison Sheridan, for joining us. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. And uh, tell folks about DozillaCast and Podfeet.com and the stuff you got going on over there. Well, uh, my tagline is it's a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Macintosh bias. In other words, kind of a big Macintosh bias. But I do <laughs> reviews of uh, software and hardware gadgets. And uh, then the second half of my show is called Chit Chat Across the Pond, where I interview people I think are interesting. We talk about security, photography, um, uh, all kinds of different things. In fact, we had Jason and Sarah and Tom have all been on. And uh, in fact, next Sunday's show, uh, Tom will be my guest, actually Ooh. talking about television. So be sure to tune into that. The <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we had a we had a big blast doing that. Uh, it's a weekly show. It's audio only. It comes out absolutely every single Sunday night. I'm uh, past eight years doing the show. More than 430 shows, I think, something like that. So it's one you can count on for your Monday morning commute. Check it out, podfeet.com. Thank you, Allison. And uh, thanks, thanks to folks in the subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Those are the people who are helping shape the show, and you can be one of them. Just go in there, sign into Reddit, and make your votes known technewstoday.reddit.com. You can find us on the web, by the way, Jeff Needles and Superdog say that it's sunny in Massachusetts today. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, and give us a call, leave us voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Jeff Bacalar from the 404 and CNET joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.